northern Canada's Mackenzie Delta region. From the vast expanse of the Tuk Toyuktuk Peninsula to the mouth of Canada's largest river and the town of Inuvik beyond. Exploring inland Arctic waterways. The Mackenzie River system is our highway from one community to the other. Preserving food in an underground chamber of ice. It's cold down there year round. It's about minus 10 down there right now. And reaping the benefits of 24 hour sun. All of the vegetables and the flowers that you can see are sort of coming into bloom. Now, we reveal the secrets of Canada's northern boundary, more than 160,000 kilometers of Arctic frontier. Canada over the edge. On the northern edge of the Tuktoyuktuk Peninsula, the community of Tuktoyuktuk is located on pristine Arctic waters, where the Mackenzie River Delta meets the Beaufort Sea. Tuktoyuktuk, or Tuk as it is known locally, has been home to the Western Arctic Inuit, or Inuvialuit peoples for thousands of years. But in the 19th century, the local population was decimated by influenza, brought here by American whalers. It would take decades for Tuck to recover, beginning in the 1920s, when Inuit from Alaska and Herschel Island moved east. Today, Tuktoyuktuk is home to 900 people. They are involved in hunting, fishing, tourism, and the marine transportation sector. It is a thriving remote community. Tuk is located just north of the 69th parallel, the northernmost community in mainland Canada. And despite its remote location, residents have found ways to survive here. And while modern life has largely replaced the old ways, some relics remain. My name is Kyla Kasun taylor and I'm a tour guide in a Tuk Tuk Tuk. At the northern edge of town, this tiny shed holds a wealth of tradition and riches. It is Tuck's community freezer a frozen tunnel, once used by the families of Tuck to preserve their food through the warm summer months. Today, it is still used by hunters and trappers in the region. Basically, a lot of people here still live a really traditional lifestyle, so we do a lot of hunting and fishing. Um, people get whales, bluga whales, right here from Tuck, so the only way to really keep enough food for the winter would be to freeze it or to dry it in the summer. So they made the ice house. Um, before electricity, there's no way to keep anything fresh. So they, you know, use picks and axes and things like that. And they dug into the permafrost and it's cold down there year round. Usually about, it's about minus 10 down there right now. The ice house is the last of its kind. And while it is still operational, the community of Tuck has opened it to curious visitors for decades including the Queen of England, who visited in 1970. Just about everyone's uh, camps that they had or um, sites that they used um, year-round would have ice houses that they would dig. 
You don't have to dig too far down. This one here is really elaborate. Um, it's very, very deep and it has multiple tunnels and, and rooms. So basically, I mean, when you walk up, the first thing you think is it's an outhouse. <laughs> it's just this tiny thing. Everyone always thinks of the ice house and they think of a big house and you know, you plug it in or something and it's a frozen, like a walk-in freezer would be, but actually it's just the hole straight down. Inside the structure, Kyla Kasun Taylor begins his descent into the permafrost. climbed down 30 feet into the permafrost. <laughs> so we made it. We're in the, the layer between the hot part of the earth and the cold part. It's about 100 feet thick and it's solid ice and mud. You can actually see the different layers of water, mud, sediment all been frozen together. It's what keeps our food cold. It, what's, it freezes solid. You a cup of water and an hour or two it'd be frozen solid down here. It's nature's freezer, basically exactly what it is. The underground freezer features three dark corridors branching off in different directions with dozens of storage compartments all permanently encased in ice. So we're gonna head down here and check it out and if we're lucky enough, uh, one of them might be open and we can check it out and see if we find anything. Every family would have a, uh, a room that would be designated theirs. And that's where they would keep all their food. But you can see how much work would go into digging something like this out um, with, you know, picks and axes and shovels and, you know, digging through the ice and then hauling it up that long ladder all the way up to the top. A lot of work. Yeah. You can see the, the crystals coming down from the roof. It's uh, condensation, it's freezing. Yeah. So we're at the end here. Looks like, looks like this door looks like it uh, might have a room here that you can check out. At the end of one icy passageway, Kasun Taylor finds a large storage space, but it is empty. Before the freezer, this would be full of fish and caribou and whale and all kinds of stuff. They're about eight feet by eight feet. And it's freezing cold. But in the wintertime, it's beautiful to come down here because minus 40 up top and it would be only about minus nine down here. So it's actually kind of a nice place to hang out. <laughs> Next, he heads down another frozen corridor. So we're just gonna come down the, the one tunnel here. There's three tunnels. Um, they're about 50 feet long. Each tunnel has eight different rooms in it. Each family will have a room. This one here is locked, so it's probably got some good stuff in it. Um, each family would have a room. Before freezers, you know, they'd be muktuk and whale, fish, seal, anything that they could catch in the summer months uh, that they would freeze that so that they could eat it and uh, survive the winter. Finally, he finds another compartment and a frozen jackpot. This is what they would have looked like before freezers. You've got piles of fish, you've got pails of muktuk, you have a whole seal, <laughs> big chunks of caribou. Um, this is what they would have looked like. Um, you'd come down here with your, your little ax and stuff and you would break apart some fish and take it up to eat it or for your dogs. Um, this, this is uh, the mother load. <laughs> Makes me hungry just looking at it. The community of Tuktoyuktuk has long been known for its valuable hunting and fishing grounds and its unique location at the northern edge of mainland Canada.
but Tuk Tuk Yuk Tuk has other notable features. It is a major transportation hub in the north, with an airport connecting it to Inuvik and destinations beyond. driving force behind much of the region's economy. All around, relics can be seen from the oil and gas boom of the 1970s and the industrial operations of today. But the biggest news in Tuk to Yuk Tuk is the long-awaited construction of a highway to the south. For years, Tuk has been cut off from the outside world, only accessible by sea, air, or ice. The year-round highway is a massive project. It will take four years and cost $229 million. Once completed, it will connect Southern Canada to the shores of the Arctic Ocean for the first time. Heading west from Tuk to Yuk Tuk, we trace the shores of Kogmalit Bay on approach to the mouth of the Mackenzie River. And here, the flow of Canada's largest river creates an incredible sight. Millions of pieces of driftwood line these shores. They have been carried hundreds of kilometers from the interior of northern Canada by the powerful current of the Mackenzie River. And while Tuk to Yuk Tuk's new highway is constructed just kilometers away, this driftwood marks the path of the old highway, which continues to thrive. This stretch of delta is an ice road for much of the year, allowing access to Inuvik some 130 kilometers away. summer months, it is the lifeblood of the north, with resupply barges heading east to Tuk, Polituk, and beyond.
Further west, we approach the Mackenzie Delta region, a stunning mix of tundra, flowing rivers, calm channels, sandbars, and lakes. The Mackenzie Delta is comprised of the Tuck Peninsula, Richards Island, and the Mackenzie River itself, stretching to Inuvik and beyond. It is a landscape few from the south will experience. Those who do say it is an awe-inspiring wonder. Uh, my name is George Sarantagos, and I'm a pilot with North Wright Airways in Inuvik. And I fly mainly between Inuvik and Taktiak Tak Northwest Territories. Sarantagos conducts daily tours of the Delta region, heading downriver from Inuvik to Tuk. So the first feature I show people on our uh, flights up to Tuk uh, is the uh, disappearing tree line that uh, pretty much starts right off the East Channel and uh, it disappears pretty quickly just because again with the, the rise in terrain and uh, we'll notice we go from an abundance of trees and different uh, terrain to pretty much flat land and a lot of lakes. Another feature is the region's unique connection to the Cold War era. Like many northern stops, Tuck is home to a dew station. The dew line, otherwise known as the distant uh, early warning line, was put together during the Cold War era. There's many different radar stations that were posted up in the uh, Northwest Territories to keep an eye on the uh, Russians during the Cold War. On our flight, what we see is a, uh, a radar station, which is pretty much standing on its own. And uh, yeah, it's just amazing to see that they're still standing today. Finally, Sarantakos says the most fascinating feature of the Mackenzie Delta comes from the ice below ground. So the most amazing features uh, that we'll be seeing is the, uh, the famous pingos. And uh, now what these pingos are, are pretty much earth covered ice hills that stand uh, just a couple miles south of uh, the town. And over many, many years, the ice uh, it freezes and then it melts again and the ice kind of collects on itself and the earth covers over the ice and now they pretty much look like ice mountains really over the town of Tuck. The Pingos have become an iconic and protected feature on this northern Canadian landscape. So just outside of Tuck, about five kilometers outside of Tuck, you'll find the Pingo Canadian Landmark. Um, it houses eight of the largest pingos within the peninsula. A pingo is an ice cored hill created when a lake drains and um, the water still in the sediment starts to freeze and has nowhere to go but up. Pingos can be found in Siberia and Alaska. But Melinda Gillis says the best examples are found here, including the pingo known as Ibyuk, the largest of its kind in Canada. There's about 1,350 on the Taktiak Peninsula currently, um, Ibyuk being the second largest in the world. Um, it's about 160 feet tall and about 980 feet wide. Um, the second one is split pingo, so those are two largest. 
uh, and they are located within the landmark itself. So eight are housed within the landmark, but as for the whole peninsula, you'll find about 1,350, which is about, a, I think, a quarter of the world's population. The Pingo Canadian landmark is home to animal life, including seabirds, squirrels, and foxes. And while beautiful, the Pingos also hold deep cultural connections. The Pingos were um, used by the people as navigational aids, whether that be traveling on the land or traveling by um, sea. Um, they were also used as a, an advantage point to see far distances. Um, the land being so flat, uh, it, it, it's a really great way to get above and kind of see as far as you can see for caribou um, or if you're looking for whales in the ocean. For Miranda Gillis and George Sarantakos, the Pingos and the Delta region surrounding are a wonder and a natural pillar of the community. The Pingos are, are special to me. Uh, about seven years ago, we started a Pingo Pride program. We found that if you knew about the Pingos, um, you were more connected to them if you knew the information behind them, how long they take to grow, which is thousands of years, and how quickly they can be destroyed. We are finding people were driving their quads and skidoos on the Pingos. So we started up a Pingo Pride program, which has now been going on for seven years. And um, actually the community is starting to take better care of them. We take students from Inuvik and students from Tuck each year and bring them to the Pingos for two days. And they um, are, you know, encouraged to do low impact events on the Pingo. That's like sliding, hiking, snowshoeing, rather than um, the, the heavy impact, which comes through quads and skidoos. This is working in the community and their people are actually respecting them and staying off of them a bit more. Flying over uh, the Mackenzie Delta, it's uh, something that I never thought I'd ever do in my career. And to be able to do it at such a young age is something that uh, I'll never forget, obviously. And it's something that uh, not a lot of people get to see in their lifetime. So to be able to do this as a career is something that I'll never forget. Continuing west from Pingo Canadian Landmark, Richards Island is a vast open expanse, separating the western edge of the Mackenzie Delta from the Beaufort Sea. Richards Island measures more than 2,000 square kilometers and like much of the Delta, is marked by tiny lakes and rivers. The island was named in 1826 in honor of John Richards, governor of the Bank of England. 150 years later, Richards Island was a hub for oil and gas exploration in the region. Today, it is barren remote territory, home to animals like the Canadian reindeer and the mighty grizzly. Moving south, we approach the mouth of the Mackenzie River. This incredible waterway stretches more than 1,700 kilometers inland to the western edge of Great Slave Lake. The Mackenzie watershed is massive, 
measuring more than 1.8 million square kilometers, an area larger than the province of Quebec. And while there are no permanent settlements between Tuktoyaktuk and Inuvik, the river remains a destination for many. My name is Jerry Kassoon and uh, I'm a guide with uh, Up North Tours. Uh, we do guiding uh, throughout the Mackenzie River Delta. Uh, the Mackenzie River Delta being uh, the second largest delta in North America. Uh, and the Mackenzie River itself, uh, longest river in, in, in Canada. The, the Mackenzie River system that we're situated on here is our highway. From, uh, from one community to the other. The river has been a source of food, shelter, and a transportation corridor used by the Inuvialuit peoples for generations. It also boasts incredible beauty. We leave Inuvik and uh, we, we start off with a, a fairly small river and then we, uh, we work our way down and we get the, the river widens up about 30 miles out of Inuvik and then it gets a little, little wider yet uh, when we get about 50 or 60 miles out and then about, uh, about close to 80 miles out is when we're getting pretty close to the Beaufort Sea. Jerry Kassoon grew up on this river. Today, he's gearing up to travel it once again, heading southwest from the delta upstream we're right out here in uh, Kutmalik Bay, uh, heading back towards uh, Inuvik, Northwest Territories, uh, heading for the mouth of the Mackenzie River. The water's this color because it's, it's the, the power of the Mackenzie River coming out uh, continues to push the silt uh, well past the community of Taktiaktak, coming out of the east channel of the Mackenzie. It's just the power of the river pushing that silt out of there. 20 kilometers to the southwest, the raging waters of the delta are replaced by the calm, narrow channels of the river. We're just, uh, we're just now coming out of, uh, we're in the back channel here at, at, at Whitefish Station. And we're probably about uh, five minutes away from uh, the east channel of the Mackenzie River. This is a beautiful little back channel we got uh, awesome little uh, rolling hills here. Uh, we're right in the tundra. We got a lot, lot of moss uh, on uh, covering this, this tundra area. A little bit of gravel on the beaches. For years, this territory was home to Kassoon's ancestors before illness wiped out entire settlements. At one time, uh, 120, 130 years ago, there was upwards to 2,000 uh, in Aval with people that used to live there. And uh, now uh, there's no one that lives here. Uh, I believe uh, a flu epidemic had hit uh, back uh, between the 1800s and 1900s and, and a lot of people perished here and a lot of families moved on to different locations. Today, hunting and fishing camps remain, drawing people like Peter Lenny as he gathers food for the coming winter. My main goal is to show up, fish hard for a couple of days, and take a good four days maybe, taking care of the fish, smoking them, drying them. Lenny comes here often to a spot known as Whitefish Station, harvesting all types of marine life, from whitefish to his personal favorite, herring. This is my second trip around. I never got enough herring yet. <laughs> We've got a small herring net, three and a half inch, three inch net. You know, you set it within half an hour sometimes. Maybe even when you set, you catch fish, so you gotta be on top of the game here for herring. This is a big delicacy. Uh, herring is a really rich fish, and it's more of a treat, so we don't have it very much, but it's a big part of my diet. Today, Lenny begins offshore, retrieving his float and sinker, then preparing them onshore alongside his net. Yeah, I gotta make sure you got no 
tangles or anything. And that's rip really easy. Just gotta make sure there's no sticks or ugly tangles. And that's a rip really easy and they're not cheap. <laughs> Now, Lenny heads offshore. Lenny checks his nets one last time. Anchor set there. I'm just going to check. You always got to go and check your net when you set it. Make sure there's no tangles or anything, no sticks or anything like I was doing on shore. And he's lucky he does. Oh, look at that. Good thing I checked. Textbook example, why you always double check when you set your net. Big ugly piece of wood. With his nets now in place, Lenny demonstrates just how abundant the fish are. I think so. First whitefish. It's not herring, but it's a start. Cool. There's whitefish from whitefish. <laughs> Peter Lenny will spend two more days on the river before returning home. For people like him and Jerry Kassoon, the contours of the Mackenzie will always be a second home. You know, I, I spend a lot of time on the Delta. Uh, I spend a lot of time on the river, not only this part of the river, but uh, in all the other parts. Uh, I grew up out here. This is, uh, this is home, uh, uh, this is part of our homeland, you know. Uh, we're Inuvalwit people from the, the Western Arctic. Well, I kind of grew up out here. Uh, I've stayed at different places here throughout my life. And my family that I come here with, they've been coming here for years. It's just a tradition for me now. Continuing south along the contours of the Mackenzie River, we approach another relic from an early industrial era. Swimming Point is the location of an oil and gas exploration site used decades ago. Today, the station is deserted, with one small exception. Tiny cabins on the edge of the facility are used seasonally by reindeer herders. And Swimming Point takes its name from those same reindeer who once used this shallow stretch of river to swim across each year. Further, we reach another industrial site and another cultural connection. Tununuk was an important landmark for early travelers, a marine crossroads. It marked a right turn for those heading east to Tuck and a left turn for those heading west to the Beaufort Sea. And today, Tununuk the former site of a Cold War era dew station is under repair. That station, known as Bar C, has been removed, with workers reclaiming the site for future generations.
further, we encounter a geographic landmark. For the first time in our journey, Arctic tundra meets the tree line. Northern Canada's tree line is marked by hardy, rugged trees like alpine fir, white bark pine, and alpine larch. It is one of the most important natural landmarks in Canada stretching 4,800 kilometers from the Alaska-Yukon border in the west to the North Atlantic shores of Newfoundland and Labrador in the east. Continuing south, the landscape changes again as open tundra meets the Caribou Hills. The Caribou Hills are a vast expanse of incredible scenery, endless ridges and bluffs lining the waters of the East Channel. The hills are also a natural landmark, a transition zone between northern and southern ecosystems. They are home to berries and other plant life that have sustained residents for years. And the Caribou Hills are home to animal life. For generations, traditional hunters have come here in search of caribou, known in this region for their short hair that would not shed. They were considered a prize catch to the local Gwich'in peoples who used the caribou to produce durable winter clothing and tents. Today, the Caribou Hills are known as one of the highest and windiest points in the region and have been considered as a location for renewable energy projects in the future. Finally, beyond the Caribou Hills, we return to civilization and the opposite end of Northern Canada's biggest construction project. The Anuvik to Tuck Highway features three sections, two existing rough roads branching out from both communities and a 120 kilometer stretch in the middle connecting them. Amazingly, the majority of the work must be done in winter to maintain the integrity of the tundra and permafrost.
So far, over a million cubic tons of gravel have been used in the project. Roughly 130 kilometers upriver from the hamlet of Tuktoyuktuk, the town of Inuvik marks the current end of the road on Canada's highway system. Inuvik is a hub of the north, a mix of longtime residents and those from away, drawn by employment, family, or the simple allure of the north. Inuvik is located just above the 68th parallel, with winter temperatures regularly dropping to minus 40 degrees Celsius and sometimes even colder. The town also experiences 30 days each year with zero sunlight. But its summers are warm and comfortable with 56 days of 24-hour brightness. It is a fact that has made Inuvik's greenhouse a very successful operation for half of the year. My name is Nicola Nemi and I'm a summer student at the Inuvik Community Greenhouse. I'm actually from Ontario and I came up for a different job for the summer and I just sort of happened on the space and I got myself a couple of um, plots to learn more about gardening. That was my initial interest. I was really just sort of captured by the space and the community and the people here and how much I was learning. The Inuvik Community Greenhouse is located in the heart of town, built out of an old hockey rink it began operations in 1998 and is the northernmost greenhouse in North America. So we have um, two different areas of the greenhouse. The downstairs we have a community garden. So there are 74 plots that are rented out by members of the community every year for a whole season. And then upstairs we have a commercial garden. So um, this part of the greenhouse here is the commercial greenhouse. So in the spring we start thousands of um, plugs for seedlings and vegetables and flowers. And then once the, um, halfway through the spring or so, we have a really large plant sale where flowers and vegetables are sold for people that are starting their gardens down in the community garden. So there's not a whole lot going on here right now. Uh, the majority of the plants are sold um, at the end of the springtime. And so we just continue to plant the remainder of the seedlings that we have and some herbs and vegetables that are sold um, at the Arctic market on the weekends in town. But down below, the main area of the greenhouse is bustling with activity throughout the summer months. So this, I guess, is the more scenic portion of the greenhouse. This is the community part. So there are 74 plots in this section that are rented out on an annual basis by the members of the Inuvik Community Garden Society. Um, and it's probably one of the best times that you could have visited because all of the Vegetables and the flowers that you can see are sort of coming into bloom. It's just about the end of the summer, so everyone's enjoying all their harvests for barbecues. Um, 
Like this week we had a lot of a lot of tomatoes and corn and leafy greens and a lot of other amazing things. Um, but we have also a couple of plots, um, both at the entrance and on the far side, that are for um, the homeless shelter and a couple other community groups. But with so many plots and so many plants, work at the greenhouse never ends. With a place this size, it does take a lot of work to sort of keep looking the way that it does right now. Um, so as a summer student, I spend the majority of my time just sort of um, maintaining the plots that are here. Obviously, a lot of that work is done by the members, but there um, is a lot of watering to do regardless and a lot of weeding and a lot of maintenance of the facility itself and a lot of pruning and harvesting. And we have a, um, a pretty extensive composting system that we have going on for everyone, not only members, um, that takes a lot of work. But other than that, um, it's pretty amazing just to be uh, working with your hands and um, having fun playing in gardens all day and keeping them looking beautiful. I think the most special thing about the greenhouse is just the fact that where we're standing right now and how far we are above the Arctic Circle and how amazing it is that we can even grow things. Like there are people here growing corn and growing strawberries and just how sort of remarkable that is when you consider where it is that we are. The ground is honestly frozen all year round and that we're still able to sort of enjoy all these amazing little harvests. From the natural wonders of the Tuktoyuktuk Peninsula and the waters of the Mackenzie Delta to vast tundra lining the banks of Canada's longest river to the Caribou Hills and rolling landscapes surrounding the town of Inuvik The Mackenzie Delta region is an incredible corridor. From sea, land, or sky. With centuries of tradition alive on these waterways. symbols of the past being reclaimed for new generations. And bold ideas connecting communities on one of the world's harshest landscapes. The future is being redefined. here on the edge of Canada.